So now this is a time that's really important for me in my life and in terms of channeling my my energies and in, ter in terms of channeling and clearing out and filtering out my think system, you know, the way in which I'm thinking and my actions and the way that I'm applying these actions in society and mostly my beliefs as a Muslim. So my sister got married to a man and they're still married, it's, I think it's nine years down the line, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them all. I'm about 20 years old now at this point and um, this man was a lot more into, into Islam and he was a lot more into, into learning religion, sorry, into, uh, into our deen than I was. And he had a lot, lot more knowledge than I did as well. May Allah bless him. So I picked up a lot from him. I started to understand pure Tawheed. And it was at this point that a lot of things in my life started changing. And a lot of things were starting to make sense now, Alhamdulillah, you know? A lot of my energies about allegiance, being to Allah alone started to make sense. I started to leave this system. I mean, I already started to leave this, this indoctrinated fantasy, fanatical system that is London. You know, the, the religion of London, basically. I left that and I started learning about Tawheed, the oneness of Allah, Islamic monotheism. And Alhamdulillah, it started clicking. Things started clicking. And although I was still not as straight with my day-to-day -day dealings and my actions, I was learning and knowledge is power. I wasn't just learning about anything. I was learning about my own creed, my own religion. Why I say salam alaikum, why I say Allah is my Lord, why I say I'm a Muslim. I started to learn this before and I soon came to understand and realize that even though and although for many years I would say that I'm a Muslim, if someone was to give me an application form and I would fill it out and say, yes, I'm a Muslim on that form. I wasn't a Muslim. You know, people need to understand that there are many things that take you out of Islam. Before you accept Islam and, and just as well for, for comprehen comprehensive matters now, inshallah, that when a Muslim dies, we are, we are expected before we die to say our shahada or declaration of faith, which comes in two pillars. The first pillar is negation and the second pillar is affirmation. So before we affirm and identify and testify that Allah is the one true Lord, we affirm and testify and negate anything that is put in partnership with Allah. So when I started to learn Tawheed with my brother-in-law, may Allah bless him and give him Jannah inshallah. I started to understand all of the partners that I was ascribing to Allah. Maybe not on my tongue, but it was resonating in my heart, in my whole being without even realizing. As I said, you know, you wake up in the morning and all you think about is making money. You don't pray because you're making money. You don't pray because you're with girls. You don't pray because you want to go and fight. And your pride and your ego set you forward. And that's what you use before you think about your own name as a Muslim. You think about your name on road. And that's just a system that I grew up in. But Alhamdulillah, because of my childhood years and because of the little knowledge that I had about fiqh and tawheed, this helped me. This helped me in moving forward in my life. And now I was able to grasp an understanding of a concept that was alien to me beforehand and it was tawheed, subhanAllah, ironically speaking. So this is where I started changing, okay? Now, there hasn't been a massive transformation on the outside. I've grown a beard, Alhamdulillah, you know? But what I can tell you is that this was a time now for me to start reflecting upon life. And I was getting a little bit older. Now I'm 29, I'm turning 30 this year, yeah? But it was definitely a, a turn for me in my life. And it was not so long after that, that I started receiving really, really bad stomach pains. Now, I didn't know what this was, what this was about. I thought it could be to do with stress. I never took too much, paid too much attention to it. Like many people, I hate hospitals, I hate doctors, not personally, but you know, I just don't like that. And um, I ignored it and I ignored it. And then it got to a point where the pains got really bad. And it was, it was brought to my attention that I suffered from a condition called Crohn's. And what Crohn's is, or another, another term for it is inflammatory bowel disease. So what this is, is that your intestines inside I can only explain the pain when you actually do get attacks. It's like 
a knife that is burning hot and it's got loads of other little blades on this knife and it's getting turned around inside your intestines and it's burning you and cutting you up at the same time and that's the kind of sensation you're getting it's a sensation of burning and cutting and at the same time that that pain is going on you feel like a clamp a hand squeezing your intestines at the same time sorry for sounding graphical but that's the pain that i went through and we know as muslims that pain is an expiation of your sins and it's an expiation of the sins of the believers so alhamdulillah it was something for me that humbled me you know and it makes you a bit more aware about life and death because there were times that I was told by doctors if you don't come to us for this and for that and for this and for that you're gonna die you're gonna die you're gonna die anyway I went and I ignored it again so I went to the hospital I was cut open they gave me something called a laparoscopy which is a very small telescopic hole that they make they drain some some bad fluid from my stomach and um, I was set on my merry way Time passes. As humans, we become complacent. We procrastinate. And worse of all, we forget. And this is the nature of us as human beings. This is our natural disposition that we are forgetful. I forgot the feeling. I forgot what it felt like to be on a hospital bed and be told that, listen, we need to operate on you. If we don't, there is a chance of you dying. There is a chance of maybe something else forming in your body that you don't want to live with. So now I'm just talking a couple of years behind us now yeah guys so I, I I continued with these pains I had to I had to reach I had to, to rethink my diet so now I'm, I'm staying away from fried food I'm staying away from fizzy drinks and um, I'm staying away from chicken skin I'm staying away from tough meats I'm staying away from beans that have skins and vegetables that have skins and fruits that have skin anything basically that the stomach has to work extra hard to digest Nevertheless, though, it landed me back in hospital. Um, now I'm actually speaking. This actually is not. Now I'm actually talking. I had these pains for a few years and I kept ignoring it. And I ignored the treatment that the doctors gave me, that offered me. I ignored everything. I was just with myself. I educated myself on the condition that I was now living with. It's not a bacterial condition. It's not something that you catch or that you give to someone. It's just something that you live with. Your intestines, they, they shrink. So it feels that your, your, your stomach gets blocked. That's what it feels like in essence, yeah? Nothing to do with constipation. Your actual intestines, they start shrinking. So you just feel that you can't eat as much food. And what you do eat, you feel it go down and it hurts. It started becoming a lot more frequent. I ended up back in hospital on a hospital bed. Um, this I'm talking now last July I was living up in Luton and um, I was living alone and I was in so much pain that night I remember I was not even able to get my hand to the phone for the first 15 20 minutes of this pain Alhamdulillah I made my way to the phone and I dialed 999 it's the first time that I'm calling 999 in my life um, so I went through to the ambulance now and ambulance come they took me straight in I was put on heavy sedation They told me that they were putting me on horse tranquilizers as well and I was rushed to hospital They put me they just pumped me up with morphine I'm high as a kite now. Yeah, I'm just flying um, I come out of hospital um, Later on that evening. They said that they can't do anything now Luton Hospital, they're not as active as London hospitals, yeah? Even though the NHS has put cuts, trust me, they are way far back from London NHS service, yeah? So anyway, so after that, I thought, you know what, I need to be, I need to take a conscious, rational, logical step for myself now. I left Luton. Um, I left my flat, you know? I got my deposit back and I jumped out. Actually, sorry, no, I lost my deposit because I left with no leave. And I, I'd actually paid for that month as well. And I was only like six days into that month. And I'd left it and I'd gone back to London. And I called up my mum and dad and I said, listen, I'm coming to, to shack up with you lot for a while, just in case, because my health is getting a bit funny now. So that's exactly what I did. I was teaching English at the time, but I had to stop teaching now. And um, I was just basically living day by day with the pain. The pain got really bad and I knew what was coming. So I was admitted into hospital. Um, however, 
what they found was very different to what I thought. Whereas I should have just come straight out of Luton Hospital and gone straight to, to London and, and just, just went straight into the hospital then, but I didn't. Because I was hoping that this wasn't going to happen. I hate surgery. I hate surgery. I hate surgery. I hate needles. I hate the drugs that they give you. And I hate being, being able to, I hate being vulnerable. So they put me into surgery, into theatre. What they told me, so they did a scan on me and they said, listen, we need to operate on you tonight. If we don't operate on you, you're going to die. Why? Your intestines have leaked. When they told me that, without sounding too dramatical or emotional, a lot of stuff flashed back to me through my life, you know, and I thought, this is where it's led to. And they said there's still a chance as well that you go through the surgery and it's not going to be successful. But then the surgeon came to me and he reassured me himself. He said to me, um, do you, first he said to me, do you have any wishes before surgery? And I said, I'll tell you in a minute. But firstly, can you tell me, is this surgery going to be all right? And I know at this point that it's all on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I asked him, what are the chances of me coming through this surgery successfully? He said, you're going to be perfect, perfectly fine. So he told me something completely different to what all of the other doctors were telling me beforehand. And I said to him, I said, listen, you know, you're contradicting all of the other doctors. He said, listen, I'm operating on you today. And subhanallah, when he said that to me, it did not give me 1% peace of mind. Because as soon as he said that to me, I thought, where is my trust lying now? Is it in this man or is it in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who created? All of that that I'd learned about Tawheed, the years up to that, it's all coming into place now in terms of my emotions in terms of my line of thought now and what's going to happen to me. And the only thing that I could think of was the request that I wanted to ask the doctor. And he asked me, what, so what was that thing that you said you wanted to request before you go under the knife? I said, make sure before you pump, pump me with that stuff that's going to set me to sleep, warn me first. Because I was only worried about making my shahada. Just to find that there's no one worthy of worship except Allah and that Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, is his prophet and messenger. I was put under the knife went to sleep, I woke up, saw my mother there. I hated the fact that I saw my mother there. You know, seeing your mother's face, that she feels helpless, but subhanAllah, she's an elder woman. And she's trying to look brave in front of you, who is a young man. And you should be looking after your mother, but your mother's looking at you with her face. And she's trying to be brave for you. And I thought, all right, I need to be brave for her now. So it wasn't much of the surgery that was bothering me now. Even though I was in a lot of pain, it was looking at my mother's face. May Allah bless her. And she never left me from that day. May Allah reward her. Yeah? She never left my side while I was in hospital. Anyway, I was on drugs for the next 48 hours. I was in a lot of pain. I can't remember much of it. I was in a big uh, class A drug days. You know, I was on a lot of morphine. I was on ketamine and I was on tramadol. This is what my, they were pumping up my body with. My body, um, my body was just full of drugs. I was just a drug bag. That's what I was. Anyway, 48 hours later, and I was going in and out of consciousness as well, by the way. Yeah? 48 hours later, the doctor who had, who had 48 hours before came to me and said to me, your surgery is going to be successful. He came to me now and I'm in and out of consciousness. And he said to me, right, Muhammad, you know, and he puts on that sympathetic little uh, neck nod. And you know that they're going to say something to you that you're not going to like to hear. And I was just listening to him and I was so angry that I, I was so angry with what I'm about to hear from him. But because of the pain I was in, I couldn't even tense. I couldn't even vocalize my anger because that's your core. That's your stomach. That's your muscles that work. When you get angry and you tense up, I couldn't even talk to him. He said to me, listen, we have to put you back under the knife. Basically, there was a little complication. No, there wasn't a complication. He would misjudged the fact that my intestines the part that they take, they basically taken out that much, 18 inches of intestine. They stitched me back up. They plugged me back together, basically my intestines. And they said, you're going to be all right. You're going to be on your merry way. My intestines were so finished, basically, where they were, they, they'd basically gone dead. So when he'd stitched it back up, it just leaked again. So I had to go through a second surgery. Now he came to me and said, right, there was a little complication. We have to take you back into theater and you're going to live with a bypass. I'm like, what's a bypass? I hear that in cancer patients. Have I got cancer, doctor? I couldn't talk much. He goes, no, you haven't got cancer, but I, your chances are very slim if you don't have this operation. And I'm just saying to him, please, just be real with me. 
Am I going to die if you don't operate? And he said, yes. I said, so what are you going to do again? And remember, guys, yeah? So I've got, I've got my mother and my father there. And he's trying to explain to me what it is that I'm going to have. And I'm not understanding it. And I'm going to explain it to you now. And it's something that until today I'm comfortable, I'm uncomfortable about speaking about. But this is what I had, yeah? So he said, we're going to cut your intestines. You've got your large and you've got your small intestine. We're going to stitch your small intestine and we're going to leave it to the side. Your large intestine, we are going to, which is what carries your fluid. Your small intestine carries the food, solids. Your large intestine carries the liquid. He says now your, your solid, your, your large intestine, your small intestine solid one, we've sti we're going to stitch it up and put it to the side. The large one, we're going to open you up from here to here. So just above my, my waist, they're going to cut me open. <coughs> they're going to take my large intestine. They're going to make a cut in the wall of my stomach and they're going to force, they're going to feed the intestine, the tip of the intestine through the, the lining of my, of my skin. They're going to stitch my intestine there and then they're going to put a bag on it. And that is how for the next eight months I was going to the toilet. This shattered me for a while. It shattered me for a while. One thing that it brought me closer to was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will say that. And the one person for through, it brought me closer to Allah through, was my mother. May Allah bless her. You know, just the love that a mother has alone for her child is proof enough that our God is a God of, God of love and a God of mercy and proves the existence of God. So much love in one person who has their own health problems and their own conditions. I remember it was a time as well that my dad was really sick. My brother's not in the country, my sister is not driving and my mum doesn't like to rely on anyone outside the family for anything. She was getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning, so after Fajr, getting ready, she's got health problems. Because my dad was sick, he couldn't drop her to the hospital. Yeah, he was in a very bad way as well at this time, so she's stressed up. She's coming to the hospital and she's been there for the minute I open my eyes. And she's not leaving hospital until I close my eyes at night. Now, what I will say as a, as a short message before I continue is this. Any man who doesn't show mercy to the women in his life, especially his mother, is not a man. We can be hard, we've gone through the streets, we've gang banned, we've, we've got into fights, we've done everything. Yeah? So you've proven to yourself that you're a man like that. But if you don't show mercy to the woman who gave birth to you, you are not a man. No matter who your mother is or was. So anyway, going back to it now, this woman is a woman that gave me a lot of strength. So now I'm living, I'm waking up out of surgery. I've got a tube that's running through my nose into my stomach, number one. I've got a tube running from my stomach, from the outside of my stomach, draining out all of the whatever fluid was there, number two. And then I've got a third tube in my, yeah? So for a few days now, I'm doing my number ones through the tube and I'm doing my number twos for the next eight months through this bag. I'm having to learn to change this bag. I've got a nappy now, basically. That's what it is, in essence. You're not sitting on the toilet like anyone else. You've got a bag connected to your stomach. This is what cancer patients have. What's the bag called? It's called a stoma bag or an ileostomy. So this is what I lived with for the next eight months. Um, a couple of friends, may Allah bless them, they found out that I was in hospital by their, own, by their own means and they came and visited me. But I didn't want to see anyone. I turned off my phone and I switched myself off from life. I, I went offline. The only people that I wanted to see and the only people that I wanted to see me was my family. I didn't want to see anyone. I didn't want nothing to do with anyone. I was depressed. I was angry at myself, the fact that I worried so much about the doctors and the input that they're going to give instead of Allah. But this was a time for me and this was... When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises us that He has a plan, He does have a plan. And Allah says in the Quran, After hardship comes ease. Or ease follows hardship. Verily, ease follows hardship. Allah repeats Himself in this verse. So for eight months, I was in hospital, by the way, for two weeks. 
and I lost in, yeah. so I was in hospital for two weeks in uh, the first 12 days of me being in hospital that's, the, that's where I lost all of the weight that I had because I was on a strictly liquid diet I lost 17 kilograms in hospital I went into hospital at 95 kilograms I came out at something like 70 70 something 77 or 78 kilograms. I lost a lot of weight. I, I came out as a pencil, I came out as a stick, and now I was walking around with a bag on my stomach. It was summertime. Everyone was about, they were making money. I'm back at my parents' house, I've left my flat. So I went into hospital weighing about 95 kilograms and I came out weighing about 70, 78, 77 kilograms. I lost about 17 kilograms in hospital. I came out like a pencil, like a stick. So now not only could I not physically recognize myself, but emotionally as well, it, it, it hits you. You know, it's not something that I've just gone through the knife and now I can start getting better now. And I know that there are people in the world, and this is a very important point as well. When I was in hospital, I saw people that were in hospital that had heart monitors beating for them. You know, you see that, you see that kind of stuff. So even though I was going through what I was going through, I saw that, but I tell you what guys, yeah? My mother played a big role for me in my recovery, emotionally and mentally. But more so than that, I couldn't have done it without turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without the faith for Allah, I couldn't have got over the depression that I fell into. Imagine, you, you sleep six, eight, ten hours at night. I can't do that, or I couldn't do that. I can do that now, alhamdulillah. I couldn't do that. Because I'm waking up every one and a half, two hours to empty my bag. If you don't, you're going to be in a messy situation. You feel me? So, any, for example, any women before at that time, they may have been interested in wanting to get married to me, shun them away. Friends that wanted to meet up with me, shun them away. Any work, locked myself off. And the only people I would allow to see myself was family. However, there was one brother, and I will say his name, inshallah, for the camera as well. I'll say his name for you, Lord. His name is Ayman Marwa and you can find this brother on uh, social media, you can find him on Facebook, and mashallah, he does a lot of events. My mother had sent me, when I come out of hospital and I was living with this situation, with this condition, my, my mother had sent me a video of this brother, he's from South East London and um, he got stabbed, he got stabbed uh, two, two and a half, three years prior to that and he was living with the same condition that I was living with. When he put out the video, he looked like he was very early 20s. Now I'm late 20s. So although the video my mom sent to me was to give me an understanding and a message to, you know, look, there is someone else that has the situation as you. For me, the situation was to man up and embrace what I had, which I did. I started embracing it, you know, I started embracing it. And for the first time in like a week, I left the house. But I felt very vulnerable outside, I'll be honest with you. And this is, this is an area that I grew up my whole life. And I've never felt, alhamdulillah, never felt vulnerable in my area. Alhamdulillah. And you know what? Wallahi, any, anything that I am and anything that I'm not is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any confidence that I have, any bravery that I have, everything is from Allah. And any fear that I have, inshallah, I only put my fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. But this was the first time that I went outside with no confidence. What happens if I fall and I fall on my intestine? It's on the outside of my body. What happens if a dog sniffs that flesh and he goes for me? What happens if I get into a physical fight? What happens if my sister calls me and says, listen, I need some help. Something's happening to me. Someone's trying it with me. This is that. What happens if friends call me up and they say, this is happening, that's happening. And I need to go back home. What am I going to do? For me, it was... Allahu Akbar. For me, it was a time that I'd been so, I felt that I was so self, astaghfirullah al secure and self-sufficient and strong. But now I was realizing that the same source of this self-sufficiency and strength that had given me whatever I thought I was, had taken it away from me like that. And he put me in an embarrassing situation, Allahu Akbar. 
والله sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he brings us blessings in the form and disguise of pains and misery and suffering and they are there to give us warning I could have lost my, my life in hospital that night for example but I didn't I suffered now maybe I'm not in the best place in my life that I am right now but alhamdulillah what I can say and Allah knows best that I'm doing a lot better work than I was doing before I went to hospital and before I had a bag on my stomach so so what led me to speak is corner now so this is like so now we're in a situation just going back and talking about my brother-in-law now yeah may Allah bless him and give him Jannah and his family inshallah I mean um, this was the first person that I actually let into my life because he was my family now wasn't he so he's the first person that I let into my life into my dealings into my ways so he came to see the kind of things that I was involved in, for example. And I wasn't afraid for him to give me an opinion upon that and to watch me and to, you know, place his own opinions on, on, on my ways because he was family now at the end of the day. But what I will say is this, look, when you're involved in so much wrong, in such a wrong path, and then someone comes and they show you the right path, it's like light. It really is. It's like, and it's like a wake up call to you. So now, I started spending a lot of time with him and I didn't mind. It didn't seem like in a way that I was that I was begging friend that I was leaving my circles and spending time with him. He's my family. We go back to the same family. We go back to the same house. We eat from the same plate. We hear the same the same mum talking. We call our mum. My mummy calls mum. His mum I was still calling mum as well. Even though I'm not married to his sister or was. I was calling his mum mum as well. So we were family. We were in like that. And I needed that actually. I needed that. You know, I needed that Islam. So now I'm spending a lot of time with him. Where are they going? Him and his friends. Masjids. I'm smelling perfume. I'm smelling, I'm smelling alpha. And they've never met you before. So there I was with my little shaped up little like line of a beard, yeah? <laughs> so I had my little lady boy line of a beard, yeah? This is not a beard. And my little sweet boy Tash, yeah? And I've got these full on, mashallah, brothers with their beards. And they're into learning about Islam. They're into their gym. They're into their... They're into their seeking knowledge. They're into their praying. They're into Islam. They're into Muslim brotherhood. And I became a part of that. I, I became attached to it and I loved it. Instead of going out now, we'll go on a Saturday and a Sunday, we'll, we'll, go and, we'll go and play a game of ball. We'll go kick some ball. Something that I hadn't done in years and I had a little bit of a belly I needed to lose anyway. So Alhamdulillah, that was all good. And we'll sit down after. We'll sit in half time. We'll have a drink and we'll talk about Islam. After the match finishes, we're talking about Islam. And it's with level brothers. And it's with brothers that will have your back. It's not from, it's from, do you understand? So I had that respect for these people that were around me and I came to understand Islam. And I came to understand that Islam wasn't just boring. Islam's not boring. Religion's not boring. And for anyone who's listening to this, I want, I want you to understand that. May, maybe you had the same kind of thoughts about this from myself. You know, when you see someone, they come and they're all on a humble tip. They've got their beard, they've got their thobe. On, they come and say, Salam alaikum. And then you might be talking about something, they move away. It's out of worship, but Muslims are not boring people. You know, Muslims are not boring. So have a chat with the Muslim and see for yourself. You know, they've got their sense of humor. They've got their personalities. It's just that now they worship Allah and they ascribe no partners with him. And they, they don't, they don't operate the way that I may have operated or other people would have operated that you plan your prayer around your day. These are God fearing individuals that plan their day around their prayers. And this is something very important to understand. Our Lord Allah, if you believe in God, know that your God gave you 24 hours of a day. Now, if he's ordered you to pray five times a day and each of those prayers takes anything between two and five minutes, that's not more than half an hour of a 24 hour day. You still got 23 and a half hours. Think about that. So I grew an attachment and a love for these people. I grew an attachment and a love for Tawheed. Understanding the oneness of Allah and I started having a zeal for it, a passion for it. And it grew upon me, a jealousy. And it's not the kind of jealousy that comes out of insecurity. It's the kind of jealousy that comes out of love. As Muslims, we believe that Allah is jealous for the Muslims. It's not out of insecurity because our Lord is, is, is self-sufficient. He doesn't have insecurities, does he? So, Alhamdulillah, I started learning my religion. And I started having a passion for religion. And it was only at this point that I was praying. I was only praying at this point with the brothers. I hadn't actually taken it upon myself to start praying yet. So I'll go to praying with them because it was part of the day. The same way that if I was with someone else smoking, I'll smoke with them because that was the day. If I'm out, you know, 
moving to girls because that was part of the day. Now I'm praying with brothers because it was part of the day. And when I was not around them, I wouldn't have a bar of it. So I wouldn't be praying. So it was a social prayer, just like it's social smoking, etc. Yeah. Then I came across, I came across a clip on YouTube. Actually, firstly, yeah, I came across a clip on YouTube and the clip, you can find it on YouTube. Maybe the brother inshallah will add the description in, in, in this video in the link here. Yeah? The video is called The Meeting with Allah. It's a nine minutes, three seconds long video. It's in Arabic and it's got English subtitles. I myself, I'm not a fluent Arabic speaker and I don't understand Arabic 100%. So you can listen to it. It's in English, yeah? Uh, the subtitles are in English. And it is taken, derived from Quran and Hadith, which is the sayings of our Prophet, peace be upon him, about the day that we will meet our Lord. The day that the earth will crumble and falsehood will be separated and put apart from truthhood. And there was a few lines in this that touched me. And one of them was this. So the people of paradise will be raised to paradise and Allah will be in front of them. Almighty God will be in front of them. And they will say to God, God will say to them firstly, Ya Ahl al Jannah, Assalamu Alaikum. And in English, this is, O oh people of paradise, peace be to you. That touched me. So, your whole life, you hear people talking about how they give salam and take salam. Imagine getting salam from Allah, from the one who created us. SubhanAllah, even till now it shakes me when I think of it. Allahu Akbar. And not only this, the people of paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address them and He will say to them, O oh people of paradise. So now they've been granted paradise. They know that they passed the test in, the, in their dunya, in their life, in whatever it was, 20, 30, 40, 70, 90 years. And they're in front of Allah and they know they have paradise. And Allah asks them still, now they are in paradise. They are free from imperfection and they are free from, hap from unhappiness. And Allah asks those, those people of paradise, O oh people of paradise, what else do you ask of me? Allahu Akbar. And the people of paradise will turn back to Allah and say, what else can we ask for? And then Allah will remove his veil. Allah, your Lord, will remove his veil. And those promised people of paradise will be able to look upon Allah's face and not be burnt by the light that radiates from his majestic face. We see the face of the one who created us. This video from then till now, it shakes me. This thought. There were actually two other things that hit me, that helped me in coming towards the truth and accepting Islam and to start praying. In Surah Qaf, it's one of the surahs of the Quran. I believe it's in Surah Qaf or Surah Al Buruj. I'm not sure. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, on the day of judgment, on the day of reckoning, when Allah throws some people into the hell fire, and they begin to burn and face their punishment, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He is the All Knowing. But these parables are for us to understand. They are true and they are parables for us to understand in our limited knowledge, human fallible knowledge that Allah will turn to Jahannam the fire that burns the people that have failed the test in this life and say are you full and the fire will turn back to Allah and say are there any more Allahu Akbar that again it was something that hit me and then I would say the final thing that hit me that actually started me to pray was this I came across a hadith that our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said the covenant that is between the believers and the disbelievers is the prayer and whosoever abandons the prayer has disbelieved. Now this hadith now 
I was exposed to it in just the right time because it was just upon then I'd started taking Tawheed classes and I started learning about the words like shirk, ascribing partners with Allah, taghut, transgressors, Allah, our Lord, His names, kufr, which means disbelief. The word kafir comes from the word kufr. A kafir is a disbeliever. Kufr means to disbelieve. And so I've seen this hadith that uses the word kuf. It scared me. I've been in classes and I've been preaching about Tawheed with people now outside because I've got an energy and I've got a zeal and I've got a passion for Islam. But I'm still not praying. The one act, the one act in this hadith that promotes the difference between your paradise or your hellfire. Do I want to be in a hellfire where Allah calls to the hellfire and it says, are there any more? Or do I want to be with one of those promised in paradise? That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks the believers, is there anything else you want? Anything else I can do for you? I can be in paradise and say, Ya Allah, what, can, what else can you do for me? Guys, moving forward now, yeah, back to where I was. So, so this brother, mashallah, Ayman Marwa, he was there to support me. I met up with him and I saw the way he embraced his condition. You know, he was younger than me and he went through something a lot more traumatic than me. He went through a stabbing. He moved away from his family. He moved away from his friends. Now he's in West London. He's moved into West. And he's away from everything that he knows and everyone that he knows. And I took a friend in him and he took a friend in me. Now this brother came very close to me and to this day, this brother is very close to me and wallahi by Allah, there's nothing I won't do for this brother. And um, this gave me confidence to start accepting my condition again. Now it's eight months down the line. Well, actually before that, let me say, so I started taking a lot of walks. I had a car, I sold it. I had a bike, I sold it. Because the doctors had told me you need to start walking. When I come out of hospital, I promise you, I was like a rake. I was a, I was a stick. You could have flicked me and I would have flew with the wind. Trust me, yeah? So I started walking and I wanted to stay away from smoke. I wanted to stay away from anything that was bad basically, yeah? Because I was still smoking shisha up until that point. So this is in fact, now I'm 29. It's the first time in 15 years, is it 15? Uh, 13 years, it's the first time in 13 years since I've been completely smoke free. Alhamdulillah. But anyway, nevertheless, yeah. So I'd left all of that. I started walking. I had this bag on my stomach. It's hot summer. It's the end of July, August. And I started walking towards wherever, wherever really, away from people. So I, I found myself ending up in a lot of parks because I didn't want to get myself into any situations. But in parks, you've got a lot of dogs though, innit? So anyway, I started, uh, it was a Thursday once. And I, and I said to myself, I was with a friend and I said, can we go up to the Hyde Park corner, Speaker's Corner? I want to see what it's like these days. And I've seen a couple of the videos online. Obviously, you know, I was a bit more bed prone than I was before, a little less active than I was before. So I was taking a lot more time to be on YouTube and look at, look at the world from the inside window rather than on the outside looking in or look on the outside just being outside, yeah? I went Thursday, I come up to Speaker's Corner, there's nothing happening. It's empty. Again, Friday, I come back. I walked the, the, the two miles it takes from Queensway up to uh, Edgware Road. Marble Art, Speaker's Corner, where it is, one and a half, two miles, whatever it is. Uh, nothing's going on again. Saturday, nothing's going on. Sunday, I come. Speaker's Corner's on. Alhamdulillah. Um, so now you're looking at, it's literally the end of July now, yeah? Or it's the first couple of days of August. That same brotherhood that I felt years before, I'm feeling it again now. But I'm trying hard not to embrace brothers and hug brothers because of this thing on my stomach. So I'm always conscious about this thing. And I'm a pencil now, yeah? I've literally, I've lost a lot of weight. And a lot of the brothers that are here today at Speaker's Corner, this is when they first met me as well. And mashallah, many of them have become very close to my heart. And they, wallahi, there's no Muslims here that I wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything for. You know, as we're all brothers in Islam. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tells us, none of us is a true believer until he loves for, for his brother what he loves for himself. And this is how we must be. So, um, could actually put a link to the video of the first video that I had in Speaker's Corner, but I didn't really know too tough about this YouTube, this YouTube wave. Like, I heard, the, I heard the brothers like Ali Da'wah and Muhammad Hijab, and that was it. And I thought, okay, they've probably got a social following from something else, and that social following has followed them into Speaker's Corner. I didn't know that Speaker's Corner was a YouTube sensation, basically, yeah? So I started speaking to, uh, well, I started listening in, sorry, to brother Hamid, if any of you know him. He's the, he's the ex-Shia Iranian brother. He's got his hat, he's bold, he's got a beard, he's quite wham. Mashallah, Allahumma barak. And um, he was speaking to a Christian and I was just listening in intently and I was really enjoying it. And then when he'd done, I started speaking. And I noticed a brother, a Muslim, he started recording me. I didn't stop, I stayed composed and I carried on until the end of the clip, until the end of this discussion. And I went to him and I said, what's this for? He said, I want to put it on YouTube. I was like, what? Like that. He was like, yeah, he said, he said to me this. And the brother, mashallah, he's someone who's very close to my heart as well. And he's also from South East London. And actually, Ayman knows him too. Mashallah, may Allah bless him. The brother's name is Muhammad. He actually had a channel in Speaker's Corner called Pathway to Truth. It still stands and runs and there are videos on it, but not actively being uploaded anymore as uh, he's got into his own situations. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala support him in these, yeah? Nevertheless, the brother, he uploaded the video and he said to me, listen, I'll upload the video. And if you don't like it, I'll take it straight down. I'm someone that was always camera shy. I'm someone that didn't like to be in front of a camera. You would never find me dead on uh, my picture. You would never find dead on WhatsApp. You'll never find me dead on Facebook. Snapchat, I still don't have. Twitter, Instagram. I don't like any of these things and I don't have them. I have a Facebook now, but it's because of the da'wah. Alhamdulillah. And if you do see my Facebook page, you can see that for yourself, yeah? So, nevertheless, I seen the video and I saw comments. I saw positivity coming from the comments on this video. I was just speaking about Islam. I was just trying to, I was just trying to defend Islam in its totality, in its essence. And I've got people saying, ah, oh, mashallah, etc 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 whatever it is this video is beneficial who is the brother and people are asking who i am so now coming from what i will say is coming from a sales and a teaching background alhamdulillah i'm comfortable to vocalize speech i'm, I'm comfortable speaking and i don't i don't fall shy when i speak to people i don't have that alhamdulillah allah has given me that at least yeah but I was always uncomfortable behind a, behind a camera lens. You know, I'm speaking to a camera lens now and still I feel a bit uncomfortable. At least when I'm in my talks in the corner, I'm not conscious that cameras are on me all the time because, you know, I'm just in the, in the moment of things, yeah? Anyway, so I saw it and it was good, alhamdulillah. I started hanging around with the brothers in Speaker's Corner. I started coming on a weekly basis and soon enough, people were coming up to me and asking me to, uh, to talk more and to make videos. So I started doing that. And remember guys, this eight months, I was living with a bag on my stomach. So th this eight months, while I was here in Speaker's Corner and I was speaking about Islam, I had a bag on my stomach and every so often I had to, to feel to see if I had to go and empty the bag. It's not something nice to live with, but you know what? Just coming down and reminding others and reminding myself firstly before others about Islam. Wallahi, there is nothing in my life that I have a love for more than, than speaking about Tawheed. So another thing as well. So now uh, I've been living with the bag for about eight months uh, until that time, yeah, which was February. So February, and I actually put a video up saying that I'm going into surgery. Actually, it was in one of my other videos uh, speaking to someone or the other. And I was saying that, look, I'm going into surgery, guys. Please uh, rem remember me in your du'as. And I even till that point, I didn't speak openly about my condition. It was only after the surgery, you know. And so now I've been taken into surgery. Wallahi, I woke up with hundreds, hundreds of comments from people making dua for me. That rocked my world, I'll tell you now. It shook, it shook me left and right. I didn't understand. Like you understand the brotherhood in Islam, but you don't realize it until you see it for yourself. And it's very easy to see. You just need to have your eyes and ears open and you'll see it and hear it. I promise you, yeah? And not only this, it was at that time when I was in hospital as well that a brother had made a donation to my channel for 2,000 pounds. Allahu Akbar, someone had put forward two bags, 
two back, two grand for the channel and I was in hospital. So Alhamdulillah, I had uh, some, a brother with me. He, um, he asked me, what shall I do with the money? I said, spend it upon what we said that we would do if we had the money. And that's for the technology to help us with our da'wah. So, you know, tripods, cameras, all sorts. And also for the material for reverts. I came out of hospital. The operation was successful, Alhamdulillah. You know, I was able to thank everyone individually for their du'as that they had given me and they had openly spoken to me about online. And wallahi, anyone who who has who, who was part of that group of people and that circle of people. I love you all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And those messages that you gave me along are very humbling. They really are humbling, you know? And I hope inshallah that I will be there for you one day when you need it. Inshallah you're never in a situation that I was in, but if you ever were and God forbid you to ever be, I hope inshallah that I will be in a situation that I can help you out too. Bidnillah ta'ala. Look. So now, February 28th, this is when I had my operation. I've come out. It's a couple of months down the line. Alhamdulillah, I'm happy, healthy, strong. Yeah. I'm able to do things for my mother again. I'm able to do things for my mother and my father again. I wasn't able to do before. You know, I'm able to, to stand physically strong now, Alhamdulillah, and not feel that vulnerability when I was outside. But where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took from me my confidence in terms of my strength, physical strength, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me something back a lot better. And inshallah, inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps us upon this path. Now, what I would say to everyone here is this, look, this place, Speaker's Corner, is a place that people come to speak about religion. But I must say this, look, as much as I in I, I, I invite Muslims to come down and speak what, what knowledge you have. New Muslims to the deen and I welcome you all to our beautiful religion. But kick back. Don't come to the corner just yet. And the reason for this is, you know, you don't want doubts to be created in your mind because of people who have well revised arguments against Islam. This is that. What I would suggest for you to do is learn your religion. Learn Tawheed more than anything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ And the English translation of this is And we have not created jinn or man but for worship Allah is saying that we were created just to worship Him Now one of the ways of worship is through da'wah, yes Calling to people towards Islam But before this And the fundamentals of all of our beliefs as Muslims is this guys To make sure That before we affirm that Allah is our one true Lord that we negate everything that people ascribe in partnership with him. Whether it be amulets, whether it be wood when they say touch wood, whether it be a Quran you might put under your pillow or around your neck and say this protects me, whether it be man, whether it be woman, whether it be animal, whether it be tree. Know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your one true Lord is the one true Lord alone. Allah did not die on a cross because Allah cannot die in any form. Yeah, it does not befit his majesty to die on a cross. It does not befit Allah to be a circumcised human being. This is not your Lord. Your Lord Allah is above all things. Your Lord Allah is the one who is self-sustaining and He is the one who sustains you. That is your Lord Allah. Guys, before anything, learn Tawheed. Learn who Allah is. Because if your Iman goes down one day, if your faith goes down one day, you can remind yourself of what it is that you know. Because this is the difference between your paradise and your hellfire. Even your prayer doesn't mean nothing if you don't have Tawheed. Understand who it is that you worship. Understand it is Allah alone. And always have a confidence in your faith. You know, when you know how to negate, then you affirm Allah to be your one true Lord. In our Shahada, there are two pillars, not one. It's not that we just say Allah is our Lord. We say La ilaha illallah. We negate any false worship. And then we accept Allah as our one true Lord, Master, Creator, Sustainer. So this is my message to you Lord. Now look guys, what I will say is this, look. Even me speaking about this to you today. Oh, and before I do actually, look, it's eight months down the line. The last few months, Alhamdulillah, nearly every week we've had a Shahada, Allahu Akbar. A lot of people have taken their Shahada through me. And a lot of people have taken their Shahada through other people. Alhamdulillah, I've been able to, to see people accept Islam because of my words. I've been able to see people make wudu because of my words. I've been able to pray next to people that have accepted Islam because of my words. But this is all under Allah and verily it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by His will and by His instruction. 
that all of this has happened. Destiny and your destiny and my destiny was created before we were created. All right, even your wealth, even finding a penny on the floor and picking it up and putting it in your pocket or by ever means, whatever means you get your money. This was all created before you existed and I existed. Yeah. What I will say is this guys, look, yeah. Wallahi, I'm nothing perfect. I'm very far from perfect. And as Muslims, we're not like this. We stand like this, like the tripod that the camera is sitting on to record me. We stand like this. We lean on each other in order to have stability. All right. The only one who doesn't need to lean on anything or anyone is your Lord Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who is above everything in his creation. And we must never ascribe partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. One thing I will leave, leave, leave you off on is this. Look, this is a reminder to myself before it is for anyone else. And I hope inshallah, if I ever do fall, I hope you lot can be there to pick me up under the will of Allah. Maybe you will be giving me this talk one day and reminding me. And a message to the youth inshallah. Stay away from the streets. Stay away from all of that. When is it ever going to feed you from day to day? It's never going to feed you from day to day. And let me ask you for every illegal bit of money. Forget illegal now. Every bit of forbidden money that you acquire. How fast does it go? How many of you can tell me that you've made solid, clean investments in dirty money? It never happens. I've been there. You might be there. You might have been there before. You know what I'm saying to you. You know what I'm saying to you. Whether you're a Muslim or whether you're not a Muslim, you know what I'm saying to you. The road is one way. The road is one religion. And the road will only feed you while you feed it back. Now where you're standing right now, maybe you don't pray. Maybe you don't accept Islam. Has your creator not allowed you to stand here, sit down and listen to me speak? Has he not given you hearing? Has he not given you the eyes to look at the computer screen right now? Has he not given you the heart to breathe? What are you doing for Allah? But he's given you all of this. He's given you your life. How many people have less than you and me? Yeah, I had a bag on my stomach for eight months and that's how I was going to the toilet. That is nothing compared to what people live with. Some people are born into a world with no legs and no hands. Some people are born into a world, little kids, that they just have a heart monitor on their heart, just tapping it to start working. But you are sitting there comfortably at home with food in your stomach. So what I will say is this guys, look, you guys are able to sit comfortably. You guys are able to sit comfortably and listen to me. Know that there is a lot of love in this world, even though there's a lot of hatred in the world and you lot are in your sh All right, you grew up on road and the road is all you know and the road is the family that you have. Listen, create your own family, make your own principles and your own morals, but make sure they don't contradict with the principles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught you and left with you with our beloved Prophet Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. Guys, any of you, I invite any of you that want to even speak to me on a, on a personal level, I'm more than happy to meet up with you inshallah if, if and when the time allows it. You know, I'm more than happy to. I could be in a position, like I said one day, where I'm weak uh, than I am now, innit? So we're always here to remind each other in deen inshallah. Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a professor of, of Islam. I need to make this clear now, look, I'm not a, te I'm not a professor of Islam, I'm not, I'm not a, a teacher of Islam, I'm not a sheikh, I'm not some leader of Islam. I'm a Muslim that is a speck of creation like you, that comes down here and calls people towards the one who isn't a speck of creation and the one who has created us. And I try and always speak from knowledge and never ignorance. And we try and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if I don't know, Allah knows best. All right, so anyone who asks any questions to come through to me that I can't answer you. Firstly, I will say Allah knows best. And secondly, I'll thank you for that because now you're giving me the reason to go and seek knowledge. And may Allah bless you if I attain a certain amount of knowledge and then I pass it on to people. Inshallah, you, you gain the reward from that. Anyway, I love, I love all my brothers and sisters out there for the sake of Allah. And anyone who's not a Muslim and you're watching this, please listen, don't judge Islam by me. Don't, ju don't judge Islam by Speaker's Corner or by the Muslims or by anything that you see. Judge Islam by the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This is Islam. Bismillah ar rahim wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad, um, there's most probably some brothers right now watching this on YouTube, smoking a spliff, you know, listening to tunes and so forth. There's some Muslims and they want to practice 
but all the friends that they hang around with, they smoke weed, they chill out of girls, and they want to practice, but they just feel they're not strong enough, yeah? One, how did you leave your bad friends that you were around smoking, drinking, listening to music and so forth? And how did you find new friends? And two, what advice would you give to this brother every day, listening to rap tunes, smoking weed, hanging out with girls? How can a person do that if he doesn't know anyone that practices? How can he change and how did you change? Um, what, what I would say to this, we're saying is, can I be frank about this, inshallah? And yeah, be honest, this, this is for people that are into major sins. This is not for people that are practicing. This is for people smoking weed, sleeping around, going raving, going clubbing. Guys, look, the reason why you have a bond with your friends is because you have common, you have common grounds with them. You know, you know the same girls. You may have even beat the same girls, my, my language. You've gone out, you know, you've, you've, swung, you've swung your fists at the same people. You know, you've gone and made the same buck. You've made the same money. You've had the same history. You've been in the same situations. So that is the history. They backed you. You've backed them. You live in the same postcode. You live in the same area. You have the same connects. But let me ask you something now. All of these similarities that you have with these people, if you do believe in God, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, yeah, I do believe in God. And you do believe that there will be a day of recompense that you are there on a day of judgment. All of these things, are they going to stand for you? And these people who stand for you now in the dunya, now you're passing your spliff to your friend. Now you're sharing, you're cutting up that money that you made with your boy. Now you're sitting down with your girl. Now you're talking to your guy on the phone, whatever it is, whatever situation you're in. And all of these common grounds that you have with your friends and that you've used in your life to bond with your friends now. Are they going to stand for you on a day that you and I both believe and know? On a day that as Muslims, we are told that our mothers out of fear for themselves, if they are pregnant, they will drop their load. They disown you. They will disown you. Mountains will crumble. Stars will fall. We will be on a day that nothing is left except what we've done in our past. And the gates of repentance are shut. Now, all of that stuff that you stand for and all of these brothers of yours that you stand for in this world, are they going to stand for you on that day? And even if you wanted to, can you stand for them on that day? Even your own mother who gave birth to you cannot stand with you on that day. So I'm just being frank with you here, guys. Look, this message is not the only people that this message is not important for are the ones who don't know the exact second of when they're going to die. That's all of you. It's important for all of you, all of us. We don't know when the gates of repentance are going to shut. We don't know when our health is going to be taken from us. We don't know when our family is going to be taken from us. When our status is going to be taken from us. And the only thing that we're going to have left in this world is the deen. The deen of Allah Azza wa Jal, the exalted, the most high. We should stand here as a reminder for each other. Now listen, you lot, if you lot, all of these people that would ride out for you, yeah? Come to Islam, accept Islam and come here. And by Allah, I wouldn't have known you. Maybe I would not have even given salam to you. But if I hear that harm is coming to you and you're my brother, Wallahi, I'm riding out for you. And that's how real it gets as a Muslim. Because we try to fear nothing but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And nothing that stands for you here will stand for you on the day of judgment except your obedience to your Lord Allah Azza wa Jal. So all of that money you make now, that you can go and sit in a nice five-star room in Hilton, can you get a nice room in paradise with that? Those flights that you take to Marbella or I don't know, wherever you lot are on these days, yeah? Is that going to get you a place to paradise? Is that going to be your stairway to heaven? Your health that deteriorates now for you to make your money, to make your buck. Now, when you make that buck, is it not from that same buck that you're using to get your health back? You're bursting to go to the toilet. But say you didn't have the ability to go to the toilet. Wouldn't you, have, wouldn't you give all of your money just for the ability to be able to go and use the toilet again? That's how real it gets. We're Muslims. Remember, ask yourself, even if you're not Muslim, guys, ask yourself. Even though you may have not done anything for God, God never stops doing things for you. You're watching this video now, you're sitting down, you're comfortable, you're healthy, you're well. And as I said, there are people in hospital that sit and they've got heart monitors beating for them every second to keep them going. 
What have you done for God when he's done so much for you? He's given you 24 hours of your day. Give half an hour of your day, split that into five and pray. You've got 23 and a half hours left and that's how real it gets. And you don't know how many days you're going to have left. You don't know how many, how many prayers you're going to pray left. So the answer to that question, brother, Jazakallah khair. For me personally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hit me. He took my health from me. I had to stop working. I didn't want to see my friends. The only people that I could see was my mother. Imagine my mother wasn't there, Allahu Akbar. Now, for any of us that have our parents here as well, what do we want for our parents? Paradise is under, under the feet of our parents. Did you know that? The way to paradise is respecting your mother. But to, to get to the answer for this properly, inshallah, the way that I personally stayed away from this is literally to stay away from it. Guys, look, you're men and you're women and you know what I'm saying to you, okay? Get out of that system. Get out of that system. Leave everyone behind to call you a snake. Leave them behind now to call you a snake. When you've got enough knowledge and you've got your faith up on a level that you're able to project now into other people, go back to those friends because you never forgot them, did you? Go back to them and put your hand out and give them your hand and see if they will come. And whoever doesn't want your hand, leave them be. Because your duty as a Muslim now, as I'm doing, as the brother does, Hussein, is to convey the message of Islam. The convincing is between them and Allah because I could even be a heart surgeon, but I don't control your heart. Allah controls your heart alone. Stay away from your people. Your people are the Muslims. Look, I just said to you, look, yeah, my name is Muhammad. I'm from West London, Shepherd's Bush. I'm 29 years old. You can come into West London, go and ask who I am. And people will tell you, all right, yes, this is Muhammad. And I ask you, and, and this is what I'm saying about me. I'm not some, I'm nothing big. I'm a speck of creation like you. What I will say to you is this. My promise, if you go and ask about me, and then you can come to me, if you ever need help and you're in a situation and you're a Muslim, and you need help, I'll ride out for you, even if I can't, even if I have a bag on my stomach. I'll still be there for you because this is Islam, this is the brotherhood. And every Muslim here will do the same thing for you, not just me. I am nothing different to the next man. There are a lot of men bigger than me. There are a lot of men braver and badder than me. There is, all right? I'm nothing, all right? But this is brotherhood in Islam. It's not the brothers that you've had your little gang banging going on. You've made a buck with them. You've moved to the same crowd of girls. You, you may have moved to sisters together or friends together and you feel that you lot have got something convenient going on now. No, 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 it's not like that. Because those people are not going to be there for you on Day of Judgment. But you know what? Your brothers can be there for you on Day of Judgment. Invocating on your behalf, SubhanAllah. Sorry, when you die, when you die, their du'as, they can continue for you. Now I ask you something. I ask you something now, yeah? If Allah listens to the du'as, to the invocations to Him, of the God fearing. Say you die. And say you die from something that is not Islamic. Say you die because of you got juk up because you know you were making a, a fast buck, for example, and something went wrong. Yeah? And your boys, your friends, they turn to God and they ask God to help you. But they don't pray. They may not even believe in God. God hears them, yes. But is he going to act upon that? Ask yourself that. Now there could be someone else, say for example here in Speaker's Corner or any of the Muslims around the globe. You don't know them, you've never met them, but they worship Allah alone and they're sincere in their worship to Allah and they hear, maybe they read a newspaper article, Mr. ABC XYZ has been stabbed and has passed away because of such and such and such. Yeah? And they pick up that paper, they look, they close the paper, they put it down, they put their, their, their hands up and they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they say, Ya Allah, save this person from that torment. Now I ask you, that person that didn't know you and those that did, who are more useful for you now that you're in your grave? What knowledge is more useful for you now? No. That wallahi, there is a truth in this religion that inshallah we never move away from. There is a reason why we stand here on Sundays from day to sunset, tonight, and we just speak and speak and speak. It's not for fame. Allah gives you what you have and He takes it away. It's not for money, we don't make money from this. It's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. There may be a time that some of you are listening to this and your faith heightens and my faith goes down. And maybe you'll be there to pick me up. 
We need each other, inshallah. Stay away from those who don't want good for themselves. And maybe they don't, maybe they just don't know. Just ignore it all for now, guys. Sit alone with yourself, your big men and your big women. Yeah? Go back to why you call yourself a Muslim. Or why you say that you believe in God. Go and find out who God is. Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, said knowledge is the key to worship. He also said, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Know what is your purpose for life. I spoke to someone a couple of weeks ago. And he was a very provocative character and that's what he was here to do, just to provoke. But he wasn't going to provoke me. In fact, I provoked his own chain of thought. And what I said to him was this. He said to me, what is your purpose of life? I said to him, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And we have not created jinn or man but for worship. This is what Allah said, yeah? The author of the Quran. And I asked him, does a piece of tissue paper have a purpose? He said, yes. I said, what for? He said, to wipe yourself. I said, yeah, tissue paper, yeah? I said, what's your purpose? He said, I don't have one. I said, cool. So a piece of tissue paper that you wipe your backside with has more purpose than you. <laughs> On your merry way, mate. Bro, as you know, growing up in it, Bro, as you know, growing up in London, yeah, um, brothers ready into music, yeah? And, um, and it's a normal lifestyle in this way that young men just go clubbing every weekend, sleep with a different girl, and there's brothers following the non-Muslims doing this, yeah? And they're creating babies outside of marriage and just that and the other and so forth. Um, what would you advise brothers who are doing this? Because, you know, when you get older, especially when you get older and stuff, you're going to be start be practicing and stuff like that, yeah? yeah. And you're going to be responsible for these kids, and you may be growing up in a household of shirk and kufa and this that. What would you guys? Because it's normal for guys to just to use girls, sleep around them, go clubbing, pick up different girls, and we, they think that they, these girls think they're brothers' girlfriends. But what do you advise for brothers living this sleeping around? It's a good, it's a good question, actually. Big question as well, man. Zakalaka. Um. So to to address this question. I'm speaking to the men now in our society first before the women now, yeah? So to every man who has a sister, you understand what I'm saying. And if you don't have a sister, apply what I'm saying as if it is to your mother. Firstly and foremost, I say this, that I am not perfect. But let's have this teaching for ourselves, yeah? This is it. Treat the women the way you would want your sisters or your daughters or your mother to be treated. And if you don't, what does that say about you? Ask yourself, what does that say about us if we don't do that? Yeah, we must remind ourselves. And secondly, guys, look, for anyone who is drinking and he's, and he's doing this and doing that, obviously there is a transition to some people that they need to take in order to be comfortable in where they are at. For example, you know, some women, mashallah, they're able to just wrap a hijab around their head and around their body and go on their merry way from Monday to Tuesday. Some, some women, they may feel they need more time. Yeah? So if you need time, by all means, innit? no one can force you to do anything. No one's putting a gun to your head and saying, stop drinking. No one's putting a gun to your head and saying, stop smoking. But they are telling you to stop drinking and stop smoking. Yeah? There's no compulsion in religion. Pro the prohibition of drinking and the prohibition of all of these things is part of your worship if you do it for the sake and love and obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, but I will say this, your sins, even if you do intend to stop them, but not straight away. Even if you don't intend to stop them, at least keep your sins behind the closed door. Ima just imagine this, imagine this one thing, yeah? Look at me. All right, I'm a, I'm a Muslim man with a beard and I have a beard because I'm a Muslim, fine. But I'm half white, right? Many of you could look at me and think I'm an English guy. I could put in an accent, for example, and speak as if I'm from up north. You see that? You'd never think I'm a Muslim, would you? You just think I've got a beard. Do you understand what I'm saying? What I'm trying to say to you is this, look. Regardless, some people may think of you as a Muslim, some won't. But at the end of the day, for the ones that do see you as a Muslim, you have now become an ambassador for Islam, whether you like it or not. You may not want it upon yourself. We may not want it upon ourselves, that title, but we will be given that title from those, from people. Know that there are many individuals that judge the religion by the followers, which is arrogant and it's ignorant, yes. But let's be patient and know, and let's show people the ones 
we should actually judge Islam by the teachings. So that's why we should try and be as much like Muhammad Sallallahu as possible. Just for those as well, for those as well that do look at us and, and think, oh, this is Islam. So let them look at the brother and they see, mashallah, look, he's wearing the thob. You can smell fragrance, fragrance on him, he's clean, he's got a beard. He stands with humility towards his creator and keep your sins left at home behind closed doors. I don't want to know your sins. And I don't want you to know my sins. What makes you think your Lord will cover your sins on a day of judgment when you didn't cover your own sins here? All of my Ummah will be forgiven except those who broadcast their evil. All of my Ummah will be forgiven except those who have broadcast their evil. Imagine that. Subhanallah, it's a very big thing to show your sin. So I would say at least at the very least cover your sin because even when you show sin outside, it could actually affect the hearts of myself or someone else and we want to do that sin as well. Do you understand? And that sin goes from something very small that you've kept behind closed doors to now everyone seeing it. For example, if a woman walks down the street and her breasts are hanging out and her hips are sticking out of her jeans or whatever it is, yeah? Is she only affecting herself when a woman says, oh, I do it for myself and my own beauty? No, no, no. A lot of men are watching this, aren't they? A lot of men are watching this and she is taking sin. She is taking ithim for every bit of ithim and every sin that every man looks upon her. Whether they look upon her with dirty looks or with, with, a, with a sexual eye or not, every second glance onwards is uh, accountable by sin and will be accountable on the day of reckoning. So brothers and sisters, now the sisters and for everyone, sisters show some dignity inshallah. You're the future of this ummah. You're the future mothers. You're the future. You are daughters. You are sisters and you'll be the future mothers of our ummah inshallah. Wear it with pride because we have the truth. Alhamdulillah, we have the truth. And yeah, sorry, Akhi. Okay. You went off. Yeah, yeah, sorry. A bit, going into a bit I was asking you about the brothers, especially the brothers in London. Most guys, as we know, non-Muslim guys, they have a phone. Any girl that's any girl they see outside, yeah, in tight jeans and stuff, they ask for their number. Maybe they tell the girl that she's their girlfriend, but she's just a number in the phone, and they just do this from day to day. They have a, many different numbers in their phone, sleeping with this girl here, sleeping with that girl here and impregnating, having kids and stuff. And a lot of Muslim guys who are growing up in London are doing this. What advice would you have to the Muslim brothers that are living this music, player, rapper lifestyle, or sleeping around, impregnating different girls? And then obviously when they grow up, these childs are born into our homes, not on Islam. Christmas, they celebrate Christmas, Halloween, all this stuff. And maybe the brother become practicing when he's older, well, everyone practicing when they're older. But some advice to stop this lifestyle, just because it's normal, for, for men in London to just sleep around with loads of different girls and get lots of girls pregnant. What advice would you give? Right, what I would say is this, guys, yeah, look. When you go to the shop, for example, yeah, I, I just want to break it down with an example, and it's not to patronize anyone, yeah? This is a reminder. Anything I say is a reminder to myself before you. If you go to the shop and you want to buy some jewelry from the shop window, yeah, so there's a lot of different jewelry. You've got gold, you've got silver, you've got rings, you've got necklaces, chains, whatever. And the one that you've got your eye on, you pick it up. And you ask for the price, you get the price. You got the price tag now, yeah? You've got the money, you can afford it now. Then you find out that it's a returned item. Many people have had this item before you. Do you want to buy this item anymore? Or do you want to go and get a new one? For the same price, by the way. Look, all of these women that we touch in our society, yeah? They are going to be the future of our ummah or the ummah of the kuffar, the disbelievers. Let's know that, yeah? Let's also know that none of us would wish for our sisters and our mothers and our daughters what we are doing, these incident acts that we may be doing with other women. Yeah? Look, I'm a man just like you and I'm not perfect. Yeah, all of us here as men, we know Muhammad وسلم, he said that two, two, vet, two pieces of flesh will take us to the hell fire. And it is the one in our mouth and the one between our legs. Let's be, let's take heed upon what we say. And let's take heed upon other things as well, inshallah. Yeah? And let's have, let's have a ghira, let's have a jealousy for the women in our society. Obviously, look, as a man walking down the street, if I see a woman with a, with a guy walking down the street and I know she's Muslim, and I know that she's doing something insolent on the street, for example, say I know her father or her brother, for example, yeah? or even in some cases our husbands, yeah? Say she's open to doing that. What can I do? How can I pull her away from it? When she doesn't want to be pulled away from it. But further to this now as well, let's get to a state. Let's get to a state within ourselves that we are so solid as Muslims. And you know what I would advise, Akhi? 
Jazakallah khair. Get married. You know what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about marriage? If you can provide, if you can look after yourself for one day, for one day, you have enough to get married. Get married and invest in your woman. Invest in your woman. Worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala with your wife. Yeah, I'm not married yet. I'm not talking as a hypocrite. I'm not married yet. Alhamdulillah, inshallah, when my time comes, it comes. But nevertheless, this goes for me as well. Yeah, this reminder goes for me. Let's get married, inshallah. Let's stay away from haram. Imagine you get punished for a sexual act. Or imagine that sexual act can, can become part of your worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's part of worship. To please your woman sexually is part of worship. And for your woman to please you sexually is part of worship. Sorry, not woman, wife. Yeah? So. I'll just like to round up one thing. I will, this will go to the parents. Most of this video was for, I make these videos for young kids in the streets, in the, you know, in the streets, into music. For Muslim, most Muslim kids growing up in London, unfortunately, their parents are cultural Muslims. So what happens, maybe they, their parents send them to Quran school when they're small, but they don't really know. If you ask most Muslim kids why Islam is the truth, they don't know. So. What I would say is that most Muslims in this country are born into a cultural Islamic family. I was a revert to Islam. Now what I would say is that to the parents, please, if you don't know this, there's a word called Tawheed and there's a word called Akida. Please learn what this is because your kids are going to most likely go to non-Muslim school. And when your kids ask you why it's Islam and the truth, as he gets older and he goes secondary school and he goes college and so forth, he's going to become curious. He's going to meet Hindus, he's going to meet Sikhs, he's going to meet atheists and he's going to, they're going to ask you why is Islam the truth? If you don't know, how can you expect your kids to practice? You can't just beat your kid and send him to Quran school yeah, and expect him to be a Muslim when he gets older and as he gets older, as the norm is with young people, they get curious they may experiment with a bit of weed, drinking, smoking, girlfriends and boyfriends but if you talk, teach them to heed and you teach them Akida, they will, they will know why they will know why Christianity is false. They will know, know why the religion of the West, YOLO, you know, making money during the week, you know, smoking drugs on the weekend, sleeping with strangers on the they will they will know. And they, as long as they have that anchor, eventually they can come back to it. But if you don't teach your kids to heed or Akida, why Islam is the truth, or this, that and the other, when they get to the teen years, they're gonna stray, they're gonna end up West End, they're gonna end up strip club and all these things. So the whole thing is most Muslims, the, this is for the parents, yeah? If you don't know why Islam is truth, yeah? If your kid turns to you now and says why Islam is truth, and your, your answer is something like, oh, because in Ramadan you fast and it's good for you, and the scientists say that it's good for you to, to, it's good for you to fast for 30 days of the month, isn't it? This is not the reason why Islam is the truth. If you don't know yourself, how can you expect your, 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 uh, your, your kids to practice? And you may have come back from back home where there's mosque everywhere, there, there's adhan everywhere, Islam is the main religion. So you ain't got no problems. You've come here, you've still kept that, that's your identity. You're in your 40s, you're living your lives, yeah? But your kids are growing up in the society, people are hitting them with evolution, people are hitting them with uh, atheism, people are hitting them with Hinduism, Sikhism, Christianity. If you haven't taught your kids Tawheed or Akida and they don't believe in certainty, yes, it's hard to practice in England. But even if they stray and they know it's the truth, they will come back. So what I say, don't just be a cultural Muslim. Get these books about Tawheed, Akida, read it for yourself and teach your child. Because I'm telling you, in London, it's not easy to practice being a Muslim. Yeah, And if you don't teach your kids, the gangs will teach your kids, the clubs will teach your kids and the other teens that are not Muslim, they will teach them. They may not be perfect Muslims in this country, but if they have that anchor, Tawheed and Akida, no matter how far they stray, they will all know where to come back to. And if you don't teach them, when they reach teenage years, they may even apostate. So I would say to fathers and to mothers, yeah, please learn your deen. And to the brothers, I would just say, like I was saying before, that it's very trendy in this country for lots of brothers, yeah, to be sleeping around, clubbing every week, sleeping with different girls every week, yeah? And having kids outside of marriage. Now you may not give a damn about Dean now, you may not give a monkeys, you, you may not, re you avoid lectures, avoid the masjid, avoid anyone Islamic in your thing and just live your rapper lifestyle. But when you get older, there's gonna come a stage, yeah, when you get old, yes? 
when you start reaching your 40s, 50s or whatever, you're not going to be raving with your walking stick and your fake teeth and your bad back. You're not going to be, there's going to come a stage, everyone, in religious or not, when they start getting old, their eyes start stuck going, their hair starts going, they realise they're going to die. At al Islam. And even the most, even the most jihad Muslims, smoking Muslim, drinking Muslim or whatever, they all start practising. Now, if you start practising, and you've got lots of kids out there with non-Muslim women, sisters that don't practice. When Christmas time has come around, you're going to see your son. When you're practicing now, you're getting old, you're starting to practice, you're starting to read Quran, you're trying to demand. Now you literally want to be on Dean. If you have kids out there in families, you know, they celebrate in Christmas, Halloween, you go, he's got a little shaitan, shaitan suit on your kid, your child, because in this country, you're not going to own your child. Yeah, so you may not give a damn now, raving, smoking and drinking, you're doing all that. But when you get old and you're practicing, and you're just thinking about getting to Jannah, avoiding the hellfire, and your kid has got a little Halloween shaitan costume off, and it's got you go there, there's another guy in the house smoking weed, Christmas tree, and all these things, it's gonna affect you. Yeah? So, you know, and just like how you wouldn't like your sister to get pregnant out of marriage, don't do it to others. So I just say, brothers, learn a deen. Yeah, there's there's practicing good sisters who worship Allah, just like that girl you're with there, yeah? Who's as beautiful as that girl there? Who's practicing? You don't have to settle for less. Yeah. So that's all I would say. Jazakallah Karen. Um, if you've taken the time out to watch this, um, there's no point in going out into the dunya because at the end of the day, every all the lots of non-Muslims are coming from that, and the grass isn't greener on the other side. It's like the Muslims are following the non-Muslims, and the non-Muslims are taking shahada. So the whole thing is that at the end of the day, people being grown up in the West all the freedom in the world, all, they've got the freedom to go strip clubs, go nightclubs and stuff, and they're choosing to become Muslim. So all I would say to you, if the grass was greener on the, the, the other side, why are so many people converting to Islam? Why? So the whole thing is, is just come back to your deen, inshallah, live a righteous life, we're not perfect, hide your sins, and just try your best, inshallah. Hey, may I say one thing, inshallah? So I just want to give a message out to a couple of the minority groups. So now I'm looking at the one, one message that I would like to give inshallah yeah, is this. Look, a lot of the youth in this society, look, I know you're there to, to have each other's backs, for example. And the family that you lot see are the family that you've acquired on road and on the street. Yeah, that's where you've made your money. That's where you put your time and your investments into that. And that's who you call family. Now, I'm speaking specifically for the minority groups in this society. Yeah, firstly. So now I'm talking about the young blacks and the young Arabs. All right, the young Muslims and the young black people. These are the two affected people in our society right now. All right, if you're black and Muslim, then oh boy, you're a big trouble for society. Yeah, look, I know and I understand because I came from the same land as you did. All right, I grew up in the same system that you did. It's just a lot worse now for you than it was for us when we were younger. We've seen that, but we're dealing with it, with it as adults now. You lot are dealing with it as teenagers, etc. Yeah, I will say this, look. I know, I understand that they give this idea of false hope for you. They say, look, we've got this free system of education. But then when you go into that free system of education and you get graduate, you graduate from no, that, you get your degrees. You, yeah, you go through your debt. Yeah, and then when you go for a job, they look at my beard, they say, no, nah, I'm not having him there. Or they look at your black skin and they say, I'm not having him for my position. Yeah, guys, if this is what it's come to, then use your initiative, all right? It's even better for us if it means that, all right, go to university, educate yourself for yourself, open up your own business, for example. Just do whatever it is. Just work, put a bit of elbow grease into it, all right? Make a bit of clean money, not dirt, all right? I know it's easy to go make three, four bills in a couple of hours, yeah? Like everyone's been there, all right? Everyone's been there and you lot know it, but as fast as that money comes, it drops even faster, doesn't it, yeah? So go out. Make a bit of halal, a bit of clean money, whether it is working in your local game or Sainsbury's, six pounds an hour. Save a bit of money. Go educate yourself, learn about business. Invest in businesses, open up your business. Instead of having a girl on the side that you're just treating like dirt and one day she's gonna be, she's gonna be someone's mum. She already is someone's sister and someone's daughter. Go and invest in getting married. Get a woman who you think is, you know, good enough to be your wifey. Wifey her. I'm practicing and practicing, practice together, learn your religion together. Maybe she will help you get to closer to your Lord and you can help her get closer to your Lord. Why don't you open a business together, for example? I mean, these are just, these are just ideas that I'm throwing towards you. All right, look, you lot are called black aggressive. We're called Muslim Arab terrorist. You lot are called this, we're called that. That's what it is, all right, look. 
This is our society. This is what we're living in now. Now, unless you're going to get on a plane and go somewhere else, unless you're going to go back to Africa and I'm going to go back to the Middle East, all right, we're here. Let's work our system properly this time, all right? Because even though we may be labelled by our system as social outcasts, do we not? Did you not create your own family when you didn't accept your own family at home, for example, and you went onto the road and you created your own family, you created your own income? Can you not do it again now the right way? You're smart enough to do it, aren't you? So do it. Anyway, I love you all for the sake of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and uh, my brother, Mashallah, man. No problem. Mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> Mashallah. Good one.